Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to the Unit 4 review. In this review, I'm going to talk about homeostasis. Homeostasis at the level of a body, so how do we keep our um, temperature constant on the inside if we're endothermic, uh, or homeostasis at the level of a uh, population or even an ecosystem. So it's a pretty diverse unit, and so I'll try to, try to tie it all together. Uh, so basically, before we start, let's talk about what a feedback loop is. A feedback loop is when I'm taking and gathering information from the environment, and then I'm changing my behavior based on that. And so basically, if you see a sign like this, and, and it says that my current speed is 38, well, I better slow down. And let's say it says that my speed is 18, well then I better speed up. And so I'm, re I'm responding to that feedback that I'm getting from, in this case, a speed sign. Now feedback loops essentially come in two different flavors. We've got negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. And which one's most popular? For sure it's gonna be the negative feedback loop. So how does a negative feedback loop work? Well, let's say that my temperature were to increase. So let's say I were to get an increase in temperature, what's gonna happen? Well, I'm going to start to sweat, I'm going to start to vasodilate, and that's going to cool it down. Eventually, my temperature goes down. If it goes too far down, then I'm going to start to shiver, maybe goosebumps, and maybe I'm going to vasoconstrict. Um, so hold that body temperature close to my body. And so that's a negative feedback loop. And basically, you know it's a negative feedback loop when we dance back and forth around a set point. So it may go above that, it may go below that, but we're trying to stay right around that one set point. And so almost all feedback loops in, in living systems are going to be negative feedback loops. Positive feedback loops occur when we want to go in one direction away from a set point. So if I see the speed limit as a challenge, like if I'm going 38, now I'm going to go 58, now I'm going to go 98. Well, that's a positive feedback loop. Example, this is an apple here. It's going to give off ethylene once it's ripe, which is going to pick up uh, other apples, which are now going to produce ethylene. So we're going to even have more ethylene. And pretty soon, we have so much ethylene that the whole tree turns red at once. And so another example of that might be childbirth, where the head of the baby on the cervix creates contractions, which puts more pressure on the cervix. And so we really only have positive feedback loops when we want to go in one direction as quickly and, and, and uh, as readily as possible. OK, so now let's define a couple of other terms, and those are behavioral and physiological response. So what we do, if we do uh, and have a behavioral response, what that refers to is the whole of the organism. A physiological response is going to be a response within the body. And so example, um, when it gets colder and colder and colder, some organisms like a hummingbird will undergo torpor. Some will undergo a form of hibernation and some will be true hibernators. And so that's a behavioral response. The whole organism is responding to that change in this case to the temperature. Now a true hibernator, you could pick them up and knock them on a table and they wouldn't even wake up. So they're really out of it. But it's a behavioral response. Or let's say the temperature gets cold in the northern hemisphere, I could fly to the southern hemisphere or migrate. And so migration is another behavioral response. I could just go back and forth as the climate changes, or excuse me, the weather changes. But again, since the whole organism is doing it, we call that behavioral. Physiological would be, for example, this runner here it starts to get hotter, and so it's going to start to sweat and vasodilate. So that'd be a physiological response. Let's talk about the important ones that you need to know in AP Biology. And those are going to be, uh, we'll start with the blood glucose. What happens with the blood glucose level? Remember, the way I remember it is by and Ga. And so basically, if the blood glucose level increases, so if it goes up, the beta cells of the pancreas are going to secrete insulin. That tells the cells, hey, take in more glucose. It allows that glucose to get into the cell. That's going to lower the blood glucose, and it's eventually going to go down to the set point, which is around 90 to 100 milligrams per milliliter. Um, per 100 milliliters. And so then what happens if it goes too low? So if it goes too low, the blood glucose, that's going to stimulate the alpha cells, the A down here, to secrete glucagon. And glucagon is basically going to tell your uh, liver to break down glycogen and release the glucose. And so the glycogen, which is a polysaccharide in the liver, is now going to break down to glucose. And that's going to increase the blood calcium uh, blood glucose level up to a set point. Again, a thing I forgot to mention out here is that we could take blood glucose and store it as glycogen in the liver. That's another thing that's going to be a response to insulin. Let's try another one, thermoregulation. So we sense that in the hypothalamus, which is in a portion of the brain, right? above your mouth. And so basically what happens if the temperature goes up, 
That's going to stimulate our body to create sweat, to vasodilate, so the capillaries get broader. It brings more heat towards the surface of the skin, and that's going to drop our body temperature. If it goes too low, then it's going to activate those uh, those capillaries to vasoconstrict, hold the body temperature close to the body. We're going to shiver. Maybe we're going to uh, get goosebumps as we try to hold our hair up on end, and that's going to raise the temperature. Now, what is this? It's a feedback loop. What type? It's a negative feedback loop because we're trying to stay close to that core body temperature as we possibly can. Let's go to osmoregulation because we do that as well. So what's osmoregulation? That's basically keeping the osmolarity in our blood the same. So right here we're looking at an organ called the kidney, and the kidney does essentially two things. One thing it does is it filters the blood, and the second thing is it regulates uh, osmolarity. So it osmoregulates. So I'm running out of room. Uh, so let's go look at some of the parts of it. So if we look at this, this is the functional unit of the kidney. Basically blood is going to flow in this direction. It's eventually going to enter into the glomerulus where it goes to a dead end, and essentially the small little bits are going to be filtered out. Once it gets filtered out, it enters into the filtrate, and that's going to eventually go on our way down the loop of Henle and through the collecting duct, and it's eventually going to go into the bladder and be on its way. So we've filtered out some of the th small things, but we may want to reabsorb some of those and secrete some that we don't want. And so it does this job of filtering the blood. But the other thing that it does is it osmoregulates. And so if you've ever noticed that your urine will change color from really, really uh, yellow to really, really clear, well, that's as a result of your collecting duct. So basically what we're doing is we're deciding, do we have enough water inside our body? If so, then we can let some of that H2O go. If we don't have enough of that water, then we're going to keep that water. So we can regulate how much, how permeable this is to water, and so we can uh, osmoregulate. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic means living factors, abiotic are going to be non living factors. So let's say we reintroduce the wolf into Yellowstone Park. That would clearly be a biotic factor. Let's say the carbon dioxide levels on the planet are increasing, leading to global warming. That'd be an abiotic factor. Let's say we're looking at how the population of snowshoe hare, or excuse me, snowshoe hares is going to affect the lynx population. That'd clearly be responding to biotic factors. Uh, let's try this one. We've got, um, if we ever have a surface and we have water flowing over that surface, bacteria will create something called a biofilm, so they'd be responding to abiotic factors in order to maintain homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis is also going to reflect evolution. And so if we've got a worm and an earthworm and a lion, and they all essentially have the same method for getting rid of nitrogenous waste, it's essentially uh, a filtrate uh, material moving in and then filtering off the smaller material. Well, that suggests that this was a problem that was solved and it's just continued to be solved in the same way over time. And so homeostasis shows uh, this homologous structure, this ability to uh, excrete waste. If we look at something like getting oxygen into our, our body, well, if you're in water and you're on land, you're facing different constraints. And so if you're in the water, basically it's really moist, which is great for absorbing oxygen, but there's not a lot of oxygen there. And so the evolution of the gill with its countercurrent exchange works efficiently there. As organisms eventually went from fish to amphibians and eventually uh, to reptiles, we moved on to land. That just didn't cut it anymore because now we had this problem of a, a moist environment that we had to bring with us. We couldn't use that anymore. We had the advantage of all this oxygen and so the gills simply don't work anymore. And so now we had a split. So we've got the split to the gills and a split to the lungs. And so that shows um, the homeostasis or that bifurcation of that homeostatic mechanism shows evolution as well, just to different constraints. Now sometimes we'll have huge disruptions, and what that can do is it can disrupt homeostasis. Example, brown, coral, brown tree snake was introduced into Guam and essentially wiped out all these bird species. That's because it had evolved to have a homeostasis that was uh, reflective of the organisms that lived there at that time. Example, physiological disruption could be decreasing the amount of water can lead to dehydration and some really severe consequences as a result. Next thing I want to talk about is plant and animal defenses. Remember, in plant and animal defense, it's different between plants and animals in that plants show what's called non-specific defense. 
That means that if you're invading a plant, they'll essentially destroy the cells and then harden the cells around it so they can fight an infection. But it doesn't matter what that is. It doesn't matter what the invader is. They're going to have the same response, this nonspecific response. We have nonspecific response as well. It's called skin. It's called macrophages that eat anything that get past that skin layer. But the interesting thing that we have, when I'm talking about we, I mean mammals, is that we have a specific response as well. And so the way that that works is that we've got, let me grab a, a a pen, we've got these macrophages that will eat the material when it comes in and then present that to the surface. And so what does that mean? An antigen is an invader and we essentially have an infinite number of antibodies that our body normally has. So we've got a bunch of cells, we call these B lymphocytes, each of them have different antibodies on its surface and we literally have almost an infinite number of shapes at the end of these antibodies. And so we're infected by an organism, we can basically find the one where there's a perfect fit between the antigen and the antibody, and then we simply produce a lot of those B lymphocytes. And so the way we do animal defense, remember, is to sense the shape, T helper cell sits right in the middle, it is going to transmit that shape to the B cells so we can make more antibodies and more memory B cells so we don't get succumb to that same infection in the future, but we also make killer T cells so we can target cells that have been infected already. Um, next thing as far as development goes, there are three big terms on here that I'd like you to understand or, or have a good remembrance of, and that would be um, differentiation. So if we start up here, basically when a cell starts as a stem cell, it hasn't decided what kind of a cell it's going to become. But when it becomes a red blood cell or a neuron or a typical just, uh, we could say this is an epithelial cell, how does it do that? Well, it does that by basically suppressing certain genes. And so if it is a neural cell, for example, there are going to be all these genes that make a neural cell uh, or a neuron. All the other bits of that chromosome are essentially going to wad up. And so they're methylated and so that they can't function. And so once a cell has decided uh, what cell it's going to become, then it then it has differentiated. And this is kind of a one-way boat. You don't go back from a cell to a stem cell. Um, how do the cells figure out which cell they're going to become? Well, they're secreting these tissue-specific proteins, and so when you have a bunch of stem cells together, they're communicating to the cells around them, telling them, hey, this is the cell I'm going to become. So we call this differentiation in cell growth, but what happens if a cell dies? That process is called apoptosis, and that's just as important. And so it's not only the formation of the cells that make this embryo, but it's the death of the cells between the fingers that forms those fingers. And apoptosis is really important in development overall. We've got a set of genes that control that. One other thing, remember, we talked about was the Hox genes and how the Hox genes put body parts in the right spot. And the Hox genes found in fruit flies, mice, and us are essentially the same thing, suggests that they're homologous. How do we sense our environment? Well, that is through, if we're a plant, through phototropism. Essentially, a plant is going to grow towards the light, and the way it does that is the auxin, which is that plant hormone, is going to move in the stem away from the light. So it's going to move in this direction, and that's going to cause the cells on the dark side to move towards the light. So that's day-to-day -day response. Photoperiodism is when a plant using phytochromes is figuring out how much nighttime are we having. So they can figure out essentially the season. Now we respond to our environment as well. We use what are called circadian rhythms. And so that's essentially our pineal gland secreting melatonin. And so we can kind of tell what time of the day it is. So right now it's uh, almost two o'clock. And so I start to get sleepy in the afternoon. Uh, quorum sensing, remember, is used by bacteria. It's a way to respond to each other and their environment and make sense of their environment. And then the last thing that I want to leave you with is this idea of how did all this come to be? How did we get all these organisms and ecosystems and things responding to their environment? That's essentially through natural selection. In other words, how does a plant know that it's a perfect time of the year to flower using photoperiodism well, they didn't just figure that out. There were a bunch of those that flowered here, a bunch of those that flowered here. These ones flowered too late and they didn't make it. These ones flowered too early and they didn't make it. So we have this perfect bell-shaped curve. And so a bower bird 
figuring out this beautiful bower to attract a female is simply going to be selected for. The better it's selected through sexual selection, the better that bower is going to become. And it's fun to speculate, like how did pollination come to be? How did that first bee transfer pollen from that first flower? Well, it was probably an accident, but it gave advantage to that. And through, so new, through natural selection, we were able to uh, develop that mechanism. And so that's homeostasis. I know it's all over the place, but it's really important, and I hope that's helpful.